From the ATX Hot Sauce Studio in Austin, Texas, it's the Jeff Ward Show. Award-winning and all-natural, ATX Hot Sauce has the perfect sauce for you. Flavor first, heat second, and not just local, going national. Go to ATXHotSauce.com. I'm Jeff Ward, and the only agenda here is to make you think. If you'd like to riff on this topic, you should. Send a tweet, at Jeff Ward Show. Scott Braddock is the editor of the highly respected political newsletter, The Quorum Report. He's a longtime journalist here in Texas. He's moderated a few debates, and he's with me today because there's going to be only one debate between Beto O'Rourke and Greg Abbott in what is likely to be the closest governor's race since 1994 when George W. Bush beat Ann Richards. It's safe to say the entire country is watching this race. Hey, Scott, thanks for coming on. Um, of course. Do you, do you agree with this? I, I looked it up last night that... This will be the closest race. Here's a prediction. The closest race since 94, which I think was 7.5 percentage points. That was George W. Bush beating Ann Richards. Will this be the closest governor's race since since then? Uh, who knows? I mean, look, this is a lot more art than science. And let me tell you, if anybody believes what they see in the public polling, I would like them to all slow down a little bit. Remember how all the polls showed that Trump was going to beat uh, Clinton? Right. I mean, the polling industry has taken a real, uh, you know, shellacking in the last, uh, you know, few cycles here. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. But I'll tell you, you know, if you look at the polling, um, a lot of these public polls show a six or seven point race. There are some that are closer to 10 points, something like that. Uh, but those polls don't have the kind of resources behind them that the real quality polls in Texas have. And the real quality polls are the ones that are owned by Republican campaigns, the, the internal polling of, for example, Governor Abbott. And Jeff, did you know this? Abbott has so much money in the bank. It, it, it's like you know, the bank of Greg Abbott. He'll have spent something like $60 million on this thing uh, by the time it's all said and done. He has so much money that at any one time he has six firms that are doing internal polling for his campaign. And what I'm told about that polling, which I haven't seen, but I have been told about it, and this is sort of the sort of reporting we do at Quorum Report is try to ferret out what's really going on under the surface. Um, I'm told that most of Abbott's polling shows more like a, a four or five point race at this point, something like that. And I was told that as recently as last week, one of those six internal uh, polls showed a race that was much tighter, almost within the margin of error. Now, we don't know how any of this is going to go. This yeah. is a very volatile situation. But I would say it's a more uh, competitive political environment than we saw six months ago. right? If you think about six or seven months ago, what was everybody talking about? What was everybody focused on? It was pretty much exclusively the economy, uh, inflation. And those things are still concerns, of course. But in the meantime, we had the shooting in Uvalde. So that brings uh, concerns of gun violence back to the fore. Uh, you also have uh, you know, concerns about the electricity grid in Texas. And of course, there was the Dobbs decision that put abortion front and center once again. So um, I think a lot of that sort of evens the playing field for Republicans and Democrats in a way we didn't expect earlier in the year. OK, that that's good to know, Scott, because I was wondering and I think a lot of people that follow this stuff are wondering, why would Greg Abbott even bother to debate? I mean, what is the real upside? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that? The rest of us on the outside are wondering, why the heck would you do that if you really got a seven to nine mm -hmm. to 10 point advantage? You don't need it. Or are you saying internally somebody said, yeah. we've got to do this? It may be closer. Let's put this in perspective. You remember when uh, Beto O'Rourke went down to Uvalde the day after the shooting there, and he confronted Greg Abbott while Abbott was trying to hold a press conference uh, with uh, the Speaker of the House, the Lieutenant Governor, some senators and representatives right. and folks, and the mayor of the city. And remember, the mayor of Uvalde cussed out uh, Beto at that time um, and called him a sick SOB for even showing up and doing that. Um, I thought at the time that that would be the only face-to-face -face confrontation that Abbott and Beto would have during during the entire campaign. At that point, I thought that Abbott's campaign thought, look, hey, we need to have really tightly controlled appearances by the governor. As you suggest, there is the most downside risk for him in a debate like this. Uh, but let's also say that, look, it's a time-honored tradition in Texas. Uh, if you're only going to have one debate for the governor's race, that that debate is on Friday night, during Friday night football, when most people are not even paying attention to it. Right. Although in past cycles, we didn't have as much of what happens now, where a lot of what happens in real time at the debate will then sort of uh, you know, be fanned out on social media. You'll see the ripple effect of that. And it'll be interesting to see if Beto gets sort of a breakout moment during this uh, debate, which he certainly needs. I mean, he needs to do something to change the overall dynamic because, hey, he's the Democrat in Texas, which that just by definition puts him behind. If there is a moment 
where he can you know really have something go viral then you might see some of these uh, moments from the debate go into the paid advertising of Beto O'Rourke's campaign. And look, uh, you're going to see, if you thought that you've seen a lot of TV ads already uh, in this race, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're going to the home stretch. Abbott has already uh, reserved more than $20 million worth of television advertising all across the state. And Beto's about to go on TV as well, you know, in a, in a sustained way uh, for the rest of the campaign. So if there's something that changes the overall narrative, overall story out of this uh, during the debate on Friday night, then I expect you would see it in that paid advertising, which is what really will move the needle. It won't necessarily be what happens in real time on Friday. Who Who is that? I mean, I, we all assume that everyone's locked in. Who is it mm -hmm. that moved? You said it's a close, Abbott's people tell them it's a close race. They've got the, the legitimate mm -hmm. polls. Who is it that moves the needle? I mean, what, what group out there? I mean, I, it, it's almost become laughable to say there's undecideds. Is that such a thing in this right. race? Well, if you look at the public polling, what we should be seeing at this point, uh, because, hey, we're in September going into October, and we should be seeing polls of likely voters. We're starting to see some of that. And you start to see the governor for the first time during the race, at least in public polling, he's over 50 percent uh, in one of the polls that I saw uh, just out this week. That means a couple things. One, that pollsters are now screening for those likely voters and not just registered voters, which is what you see earlier in the year. Uh, and also that Republicans are coming home. Look, this is what Texas Republicans always do. Uh, and it's not the case uh, in all states across the country, but it is here. Um, you know, if you go back to 2004 in Colorado, uh, Republicans lost the legislature to the Democrats at that time because Republicans continued to fight with each other leading up to the November election. That was one of the reasons. Uh, but here in Texas, you even have these uh, third party right wing enforcement groups is what I would call them. They have started now blasting Beto O'Rourke and not attacking the governor anymore, which of course is what they were doing during the primary earlier in the year. So I think Republicans are unifying no matter, you know, no matter how much infighting you see among them, they're unifying and they're certainly not going to vote for the Democrat. But as far as who's the swing voter out there, as far as I understand it, from all of the internal polling that I was just talking about, the group that's causing the most problem for the governor is women, especially women in the suburbs in places like Collin County, Denton County, Hayes, Williamson, Fort Bend County, places like that around the state, uh, where women, especially under 45, are saying they cannot vote for Abbott and a couple of issues are causing that. Number one, it was gun violence in the wake of the Uvalde shooting. And then after the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade, so many women are so upset, not just be, not, and not because they are necessarily pro-abortion. I don't think that they would say that. But I think most women are where most Americans are on the issue, uh, which is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think, you know, you have the extremes of the parties, liberals who want to have, quote, abortion on demand, or you have the uh, Republicans and the base of their party where they would say no abortions ever. And guess which policy we have in Texas? No abortions almost ever right now. And in fact, you have legislators saying that they want to look into next year for the legislative session. They want to look into punishing women who leave the state to have an abortion where it would be legal. I don't see any lawmakers saying that they'd like to punish you or I for going to Las Vegas to gamble there. It's legal in Nevada, but not here. But yeah. when it comes to abortion, they're talking about that. And so women are really upset about that. And Jeff, you know how uh, you can be having a discussion with a woman where it, there comes a point where there's nothing you can say to make it any better. She's angry at you, and she and, and she's not going to get over it. Right. Up until the point of you going back to her original point, you could go back to the original point she was making and saying, oh, look, I agree with everything you said, and she put her hand on her hip and say, oh, now you agree. Like, there, there's no getting her back at some point. And I think that's where Republicans are with a lot of women in the state. So if, there's a, if there is a group that can be moved, it's them. And if you think about the way that the Democratic base has been fired up, especially about guns and abortion, the concerns about those issues – extend beyond the base of the Democratic Party, just like uh, on the Republican side, the uh, concerns about immigration and border security, which is what Abbott's really stressing right now, those concerns also extend beyond the base of the GOP. There's a lot of just mainstream Texans who do want to see a tough stance on border security. So all that, the data and what you just explained would explain some of the ads that I think people are seeing. It was, and, and it was, I believe it was a Texas, Texas Tech football game over the week. I think it was, but... <laughs> Yeah. The ad that most people have seen more than once is this, as usual, black and white photo of these ominous looking mm -hmm. guys. And the ad goes Brain out. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes out of its way to point out the guys. And, and then that, is that where that's coming from? It's not not even specifically about abortion. As you just said, it's those guys and those guys are Abbott, Paxton and Patrick. And right. it's almost, well, I, I hate to twist it this way, but it, it comes across this way. It's almost like for every woman, that's the guy at the bar you don't like. 
it, it is sort of painted that way, and it's based on policy, right? I mean, look, you, you have a lot of Republicans who would like to talk in a more nuanced way about some of these issues like guns and abortion. Uh, but the problem with that, trying to talk about it in a nuanced way, is that the laws that we now have are not nuanced. And it's led to some really just tin ear, tone deaf moments from Governor Abbott. One year ago, when Abbott was asked about the fact that there's no exceptions for rape or incest in the law that he signed, um, he said, well, we're going to work to eliminate rape in Texas. Yep. Which, of course, you can you know how that yep. went over with women. Uh, and then earlier this year, a few weeks back, he was asked about it again. And he said, well, a rape victim can just take the Plan B pill, which, again, 10 ear That went over horribly with yep. women. And, and it also demonstrates a misunderstanding of how that medication works. And so I think they've really painted themselves in a corner here on the abortion issue. But whether um, that's going to make the difference and put a Democrat in the governor's mansion, I can't say that for sure. I mean, look, um, this is a dynamic situation. And, and we're still... Um, you know, a ways out from the election, things could still happen that change the overall dynamics, not just the debate on Friday night, but other things that could happen. I mean, who knew at the beginning of 2020 that the thing that would dominate everything would be a pandemic? So we have no idea what might, might happen tomorrow or the next day. No idea. Um, but we're getting to the point where we only have about a single lifetime left in politics before this election. and The cake is almost baked. Yeah. Which takes me back to, I, I mean, if you look at the scorecard, whether it's his fault or not, some of it probably is. The scorecard for Greg Abbott, and this is why I get back to I can't believe he's going to debate because the material that you can throw at him repeatedly and his defense of it is pretty tough. And the scorecard would be yeah. multiple mass shootings. Mm -hmm. you, you've got the abortion issue. And oh, by the way, yeah. you had a freeze that left people without electricity and dying. I mean, his scorecard, right. again, I'm not saying that he did it all, but, but the, right. the scorecard is, is pretty awful. I, it's, it's almost so awful that if someone, you know, like most people, just moved to Austin, they would look at the scoreboard and say, how in the world can that guy keep winning? Look, the structural advantage for Republicans in this state, it, we can't overstate how important it is. I mean, there are simply more Republican voters in Texas than there are Democratic ones. And Jeff, it doesn't help that Democrats often announce specific campaign strategies. So I'll give you an example. Um, Democrats will come out and publicly say in a press release, and they'll have a news conference about it, and they'll say, we are going to register 100,000 voters in Texas over the next two weeks, something like that. The reason they're doing that is because they're using it as campaign fundraising fodder. They want people to send them $10, $20, $25, whatever, for that effort. Republicans don't need to do that uh, because they already have money in the bank to do it, right? And so when Democrats come out and say, here's how many people we're going to register, well, Republicans, if you know, if the number's 100,000, well, then Republicans would know they need to register 150,000. And I will tell you that uh, there is a, a, real, um, uh, a real effort uh, you know, on the Republican side to get people registered. You always hear Democrats say they're doing that. Republicans just do it. Um, and one of the things that uh, was a technological advancement in the last couple of election cycles, and there was a real question about whether this really could be done, Jeff, um, Republicans got good at figuring out uh, how they could identify people who just moved here from other states and figure out the way they voted in those other states. Hmm. And then if they were Republicans, get them registered. And of course, we still, even during the height of pandemic restrictions, we still had 1,200 people moving to Texas every day day. Now, I would say one other thing about um, the overall election dynamic, which is this. I'm trying to figure out, because we haven't mentioned uh, the national politics of it. If you think historically about midterm elections, this should be a great year for Republicans, right? right? I mean, Biden's numbers are not great. His approval ratings are not great. There's concerns about the economy. You have unrest around the world, the, you know, the, uh, the, the you know, military conflict in uh, Eastern Europe and Russia and all of that. And if you consider the fact that former President Trump just won't go away, won't go away. It has me asking <laughs> right, this right. because he's in the news every day. Yeah, yeah, he's in the news every day. Right. That has me asking this question: Whose midterm is it? In past cycles, it would always be that the current president owns everything that's going on. But because the former guy is still sort of one of the current guys, it has me wondering whether or not the playing field's a little more even for Republicans and Democrats when it comes to the national environment. Because if it's if it's Biden's midterm, then Republicans should do great. If it's Trump's midterm, look at 2018. Republicans took losses even here in Texas. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that both of the campaigns, Beto and Abbott, have to operate within that environment. And that's another reason that Abbott's you know concerned. Like you said, his scorecard 
scorecard isn't great. He needs to explain some of that. He has the most downside risk in a debate like this in a, in a wide open forum where we know that his Democratic opponent, you know, likes to push boundaries. He was the guy who showed up at that news conference in Uvalde and put the finger in his face and said, right. this is on you. I imagine similar moments like that during the debate will have to play out if Beto's team, you know, wants to see a viral moment happen. And I'm sure that they do. And he said, and Beto has a much more aggressive campaign team than he did in 2018. You remember when Beto was running against Senator Cruz um, and Democrats were almost begging Beto to go negative on Cruz. Cruz, who even a lot of Republicans don't like, uh, I, you know, some of his own Republican Senate colleagues have said privately he has the most punchable face in the United States yeah. Senate. I always you use have, him. In, I always, uh, Jared, Scott, I always use him in, in dodgeball analogies. He's the first kid that you knock out <laughs> of the dodgeball game. That's what I think of Ted yeah, right. Cruz. Everybody uh, wants to hit him in the face. That's right. Jerry Patterson, the former uh, land commissioner here, uh, a Republican, uh, said during the 2018 campaign that he was going to go into the voting booth, vote for Cruz, and then come out and immediately stick his finger down his throat and throw up <laughs> but because he, 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 could, he almost couldn't stomach it, but he couldn't yeah. vote for the Democrat. Right. Um, and so you don't have that uh, playing out this time around. But Beto would not go on the attack against this guy who, as you point out, is so hated. But look at the way Ab uh, Abbott's been attacked by Beto throughout this entire campaign. It's been a very different campaign, aggressive from the start. And part of that is because I think Beto, he's such a well-known uh, guy. He's, you know, he's a known quantity. Um, he's one of the few people in American life who you can say his first name and that's it. Everybody, that's that's, it. Everyone knows yeah. who you're talking about, like Oprah. I don't have to say Winfrey, right? Beto. I don't have to say O'Rourke, right? Everyone knows him. He's probably have 99 or 100 percent name ID. And so he's not having during this campaign to introduce himself to voters. Everybody knows who he is. The downside on that is a double edged sword. The, the downside is that means if you already know about the guy, you probably already have an opinion formed yeah. about him, whether it's good or bad. Explain the math. This you, you just talked about both sides going out to register people. The math. Mm -hmm just doesn't seem to make much sense. And maybe the truth is Beto won't own the major metro areas like you would assume that he mm -hmm. would, right? And we've learned over time, right. this is now mm -hmm. a culture war. And the culture war is not even about policy. The culture war is urban versus yeah. rural, educated versus lacking a college degree. It just kind of seems to be split mm -hmm. straight down that line. So how does the math not, not these days not be an advantage for Beto? In other words, he goes out and wins the metro areas, and maybe you're going to tell me he mm -hmm. won't or it won't be as much as we think. You in the metro areas, mm -hmm. how do you not win the election these days? Well, let's break it down this way. So a, a lot of folks talk about Texas politics as if it was a presidential race. And I see why they do that, because it's like we're a nation state, right? I mean, 254 counties, 31 million people across two time zones. But the way that votes are allocated is not the same as a presidential race. So you'll see some some analysis where people will talk about how the candidates are going to do, like say, hey, Beto's going to win in Houston. He's going to win in DFW. Yeah. He's going to win in San Antonio and Austin. Um, but that doesn't mean he gets like an electoral vote from each of those places. Right, he gets right. single votes from single people in all those places. And in places like Houston, there are a lot of Republicans, right? So you will see, and same thing in Dallas, same thing in Austin. There's plenty of Republicans in Austin, right? They're just in the minority. Um, so as long as Republicans are turning out their base um, in a big way and extending beyond the base, you know, on some issues, including on immigration, they'll be competitive even in those urban areas. Even if on election night, you're looking at the election map and it shows that, oh, Beto won this county or won, he won that county. But also consider this, in rural Texas, Historically, and if you look at the trends and the numbers, Republicans can bank about at least a million to a million five votes in rural Texas, and those are all blood red counties. I mean, if, if it's like a state within a state, if rural Texas was its own state, it would be more conservative than Oklahoma, where every county voted to make Sarah Palin vice president. Yeah. Right. And so these are people who are never, ever going to vote for a uh, for yeah. a, for a Democrat. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the issue sets, I mean, I think you're right about sort of breaking it down between urban and rural. I would say that there's a real fight for suburban Texas um, and the fight that's being had there. Let's think about it this way, back to national politics. So much of national politics emanates, emanates from Texas. So many of the things that are nationalized issues are coming out of Texas. So many of the people who were arrested on January 6th are from North Texas, from the suburbs, right? Including the head of the Oath Keepers and all of that. The Republican playbook right now is to appeal to people in the suburbs based on the fact that a lot of those folks who have traditionally voted for Republicans are not comfortable with what's happening in their communities. They look around, there's all these people there that they didn't see before, right? And so what kind of policies are Republicans embracing to sort of be the bulwark against that? It's bans on critical race theory, it's the constitutional carry of firearms, it's you know these extreme abortion laws, et cetera. 
that are designed to try to appeal to that, uh, you know, the non-college educated white guy who supported President Trump. And look, elections are not fair. Jeff, you know, it, uh, fair ended in the third grade, right? Yeah. For Republicans, they have one challenge. Democrats have a different challenge. The, the challenge for Republicans is basically to hold together a group of the folks I just said, the non-college educated white guy who supports former President Trump. And that's easier to do uh, a culture war campaign about, right? If you lean into culture wars and you're a Republican, you're going to get those folks out who agree with you. For Democrats, it's very different. For Democrats to be able to win, they have to put together a multi-generational, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalition. And if they push in too far on any of these culture war issues, they start to drive out people that they need. So, for example, when Democrats like Beto O'Rourke talk a lot about uh, the rights of LGBTQ people and transgender people in particular, who's the base of the Democratic Party? It's not the most liberal person. In fact, it's probably more like an elderly African-American woman from Houston who's not real comfortable with that transgender yeah. stuff, right? So they can't really get, they can't, if Republicans are attacking on transgender issues, Democrats can't answer with that. They have to answer with other things, right? They have to they have to focus on issues that expand their coalition. And right now that includes uh, gun violence and trying to do something about that, abortion rights, uh, and the electricity grid. Like you said, that's something that people still have PTSD about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this sets up as, and I think you're setting it up. I mean, it seems like if Beto O'Rourke wants to attack him, he can come and keep coming and coming and coming. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there in a debate setting, which is really just nowadays about viral videos. I mean, it's just now you're just trying to generate reels. Who's going to get the worst reel is kind of what's going to happen after this weekend. People aren't going to watch them Friday night. But I tell you what, Mm -hmm. by Sunday and Monday, if there's Mm -hmm. if there's an FU moment, that's going to go viral. How does Greg Abbott defend himself you know, if, if Greg, if, if Beto O'Rourke does what you said and walks right in there and starts pointing that finger right at him, right? And, and he, yeah. he's pretty good at that stuff. And he starts talking mm-hmm. trash yeah. and pointing his finger at him. And it's about mass yeah. shootings. And it's about the power grid. And it's about stuff the average person says, wait, hell, I almost died back then. Mm-hmm. How, how does Greg Abbott defend himself on that stuff? He needs to come up with, uh, with some new material on that for sure. Uh, we talked about his answers on abortion previously, yeah. and they were not great. Uh, his answers on gun violence have not been great. He said, he, you know, he told, uh, you know, through, a, through reporters, he told uh, the families in Uvalde that what they're asking for on raising the age on the uh, purchase of certain assault weapons, that it's not constitutional, which was he was stretching on that a little bit. Yeah. There have been some court rulings, but it's not been found to be completely unconstitutional. In fact, they did it in Florida. And interesting, in Florida, where they had a Republican legislature, and a Republican governor named Rick Scott, they raised the age for those uh, firearms purchases and not one Republican lost their primary the next time around in Florida after voting for that. So it's not like something that Republicans are going to punish them about. Um, I do think that Beto does run a risk, though, of looking a little too aggressive on some of that stuff. Um, You know, that it's, uh, it's it's a fine line that you have to walk with a lot of that. Although, to your point about, you know, pointing the finger in the face, after that, confrontation in Uvalde as I would talk to uh, voters around the state, particularly women and, and, and specifically mothers, when I would ask them about that and I'd say, you know, how, who, who among us uh, wishes they were the ones doing that? And every mother would say, I wish I was Oof, the one doing yeah. that. So there is a certain channeling of a lot of anger uh, that people have at the Republican administration, for sure. But I mean, you're really stuck. I mean, what, what do Abbott's people tell him? Because you're right. He is... I, I, I mean, I'm not going to say he's in a possible spot. I mean, it's his job and he works mm-hmm. for the taxpayer, but he, yep. he's he's not laid very good groundwork to defend himself, to just say, I don't want to talk about it. But on Friday night, that reel is going to be, you got to talk about it. So what could he possibly yeah, right. say and, that, 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 that even pacifies that 40 year old, that 20 to 50 year old woman who's saying, yeah, mm-hmm. that you, what is your, what's the deal here, governor? I think that the governor will struggle with some of that for sure, and it, that's just based on past performance. He has not had good answers. Could, on could that, a lot could of these that questions. Mo- could that, Scott? But, could that moment or two, that reel of him struggling? I, and he's a mm-hmm. smart guy. This is not yeah. Donald Trump here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I always say all the time, sure. he is not a doofus. Trump right. is a buffoon. Although, although Trump is a lot quicker on his feet. Yeah, to your yeah, point. that's true. He he would fight back. But how does Abbott avoid that reel? That viral moment Mm -hmm. where he stammers and any stammering is going to look like, uh uh-oh, or, and does it, would that cost him, would that be enough to cost him this election? 
I don't think so. Okay. Um, I, I do think that we should also throw in that Beto's going to have to defend himself on some things and offer some nuanced answers on a few things. I mean, um, one of the things that's different about this campaign, uh, different from what I had expected for sure, is that the Abbott campaign has not been lighting up Beto about his comments from when he ran for president when he said, quote, hell yes, we'll take your AR-15 yeah. or AK-47. Yeah. They were, Now, Abbott's campaign was doing that back in January. Um, they had some digital ads back in Jan January, February, where they were uh, highlighting that quote, uh, the hell yes quote from Beto. But as soon as the shooting in Uvalde unfolded, they stopped doing that, right? Because I think they know, and they, they, I'm sure they have data to show in their polling that that's hitting people's ear a little bit different now after that shooting. Uh, but Beto has some things to explain, including where he's at on guns. I think there's a nuanced way to go after him on guns from Abbott's side to say, look, where, where are you on this really? If previously you said you didn't want to take anybody's weapon. Then you said that, and you've said you know about taking people's guns, and then you said some other things about it. Where are you really on that? It's a very important issue, not just to Republican voters, but also a lot of Democrats in Texas, a lot of gun owners, right? I think uh, some South Texas Democrats probably own more guns than a lot of Republicans in a place like Dallas. So um, that's one issue. On immigration, I think the governor will go after him hard on that and say, look, you have said you don't want to do more on uh, border security, which is something that doesn't just have an appeal within the Republican base. Mainstream Texans want to see border security address. So there, there are various things that Beto will have to answer for where he's at exactly on different things. Um, and I think, I don't know if he's going to have stammering and stuttering moments, but he'll be on defense some as well. But look, you're right. Beto's the one who's really got to swing for the fences in this debate. He needs the viral moment more than the governor does. The governor is the one who needs to not have the stammering, yeah. stuttering moment. Uh, he needs to just basically not mess up, you know, as much as he can throughout the hour, 90 minutes, whatever it is. Uh, and Beto's the one who, you know, really has, I would say Abbott has the most to lose for sure. And Beto has the most to gain. So to one of your original points, it does, it does speak to um, perhaps the Abbott's uh, Abbott campaign's concern uh, that maybe they're not in as good a spot as they thought they were a couple of months ago. Okay. What if, to your point about Abbott, Turning, turning it on Beto and, and, and saying, well, you're all over the map on this and the, these AR-15s, you're all yeah. over the map. Do you expect and what would happen if, and they, surely they know this whole thing, this nuanced quiz about what you think about AR-15s. What if he turns around and says, you're damn right, I want to take them all away. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. What well, happens? Do you well, think you'll so do I, it? I wonder. Yeah. Right. I, I wonder how that hits people's ears now because right. that has not gotten the kind of saturation campaign of, of you know messaging that I thought it would have by now. Uh, it hasn't been in any of the television ads from uh, Greg Abbott uh, or any of the other uh, Republican groups that are supporting uh, Abbott. They just haven't stressed it. And, they, and look, Republicans in a lot of ways right now, they don't want to talk about abortion. They don't want to talk about guns. So it's a, it's another tightrope uh, for Abbott to have to try to you know navigate. Uh, during a debate, I, I'm not sure how much he wants to bring it up. And, I'm, and you know, as far as the questions from the moderators, look, that's not the it's not the candidates who get to decide exactly what they're going to talk about either. Right. And so and so, look, I think um, if Abbott wants to go, uh, you know, on, on really on uh, offense against Beto on guns, it's treacherous ground right now. I don't know that I don't know that that's exactly where he wants to go. Doesn't want to talk about guns. Doesn't really want to talk about abortion. Right. Wants to talk about the border and, and wants to say this as many times as possible, that Beto is the same as Biden. You've seen the billboards around the state, right? The, the billboards that basically that say Beto equals Biden, both are bad, bad for Texas. And that's effective messaging uh, in a midterm election. Traditionally, we'll see if it works this time. Yeah. To flip it around, how does Beto not, or maybe it happens by default, not say, really? Well, there's Donald Trump and Greg Abbott making up some story about a wall they're going to build of which was never even done. I mean, how does he not? I mean, I, I think a lot of people get the logic of you try to attach Beto to Joe Biden, which is exactly what mm -hmm. deep red rural Texas wants to hear. But Abbott's going to get them anyway. The one thing that that works against Republicans, like you said, is not Trump. Is he going to spend time right. sticking Greg Abbott to Donald Trump? You know, I would have expected that he would have done that already. Maybe he'll do it yeah. during this campaign uh, and during this debate. Uh, maybe maybe that will unfold here in the last month or so of, of, of the, you know, of the campaign. Um, but they haven't. Uh, I haven't seen that from Beto's social media team. Uh, I haven't seen that, uh, you know, in any of their advertising so far, you know, trying to link Abbott to Trump, which is not difficult. There's pictures and video of them yeah. hanging out on the border. You know, they're going right. to build the wall down there. Um, and I do think that, look, we have two campaign cycles in a row, 2018 and 2020, that prove that, it, which is not my opinion, by the numbers, 
it's proven that Trump is bad for Republicans in Texas. In 2018, there was backlash to President Trump because it was his first midterm, uh, and you had the uh, Texas Democratic Party pick up 12 new seats in the Texas House, two new seats in the Texas Senate, and two congressional districts flipped from Republican to Democratic in Dallas and Houston. And then in 2020, look at the result. You had uh, the president at the time, Trump, uh, only win Texas by six, while Senator Cornyn, John Cornyn, who's on the same ballot with him, beat his Democratic opponent by 10 points, right? Yeah. So there's some drag because of President Trump. And privately, Republican office holders in this state will tell you that they were thrilled that he would not be on the ballot going forward after he lost in 2020. They, they don't want to go back to that. They don't have to deal with that. The last legislative session was, you know, so focused on trying to, uh, on the Republican side, was, was so focused on trying to appease the supporters of former President Trump. And I think most Republicans would like to turn the page on that, but they're basically held hostage to whatever Trump decides to can, do going can, can How does Greg Abbott get away from that? I mean, I don't know that, that it's worth the time and energy to try to try to stick the two of them together too often in a debate setting. But mm -hmm. if it's going to come up sooner or later, uh, can, Abbott, can Abbott throw Trump under the bus? No, no, he can't do that. Um, look, he, Republicans are in a, it's a good, great question. Republicans are in a box about that. Um, Trump. Do some of them say, is, we, do, was, do some of them around the state, Scott, say, yeah. it's, we got to throw him under the bus. We got, we got to, we got to kill this guy off once and for all. Do some of them try to make that argument? No, and I <laughs> certainly not publicly, and I haven't really heard them do it privately either. What I have heard them privately say is that they would hope that whatever comes out of the January 6th commission uh, sets up a, a scenario where he just can't run for office again. But here's the real, this is why Republicans are in a box with Trump. Think of it this way. Trump cannot add to the Republican coalition. He's basically downsized it to where it's at. So he can't add voters for somebody like Abbott, but he can take voters from Abbott, right? If Abbott was to do something to throw Trump under the bus... Trump would come out with a statement calling him a rhino, saying that you know he's not a real Republican, he's not a real conservative, and that's the kind of thing that would depress the vote on the Republican side. So if you have somebody in your party who can only take votes from you rather than add any votes, it's a real problem. I mean, I, I don't know that you want to make a prediction on this race, do you? Um, <laughs> it's uh, what no, you want to you want you want well, to say is it's closer than we realize. Is that is that the takeaway? I always let me say something to you and your audience, which is something that's very important to me. It's not that I don't want to. I don't make predictions in elections. And here's, here's why. Because I feel that as a journalist, and you see this all over the place, and you and I have probably both been critical of national media and the way they do this. It's a bunch of journalists and others uh, on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox all trying to guess how elections are going to go. Yeah. And it's not helpful. My role, I see it as trying to help people understand the battlefield so that as the election unfolds, they will understand why it happened that way. Got it. Oh, that's well said. If Beto O'Rourke were to win, is it a sea change mm -hmm. or is this just a blip on the screen? Yes, it's a sea change. Absolutely. Really? And in fact, it would be a sea change if any Democrat won statewide. And, you know, we haven't talked about the other races, yeah. but I do think that uh, probably the, the two races to watch closely for whether they are at least closer or whether a Democrat could really pull it off would be the lieutenant governor's race with Dan Patrick and Mike Collier, his Democratic challenger, uh, and Attorney General Ken Paxton, uh, who has a, a Democratic challenger in uh, Rochelle Garza. And Paxton, to, your, to the point about Trump that we were talking about. I just start laughing Think, when I hear Paxton's name. How that guy wins it's amazing, is really right? amazing. The fact that he may very well win is remarkable, remarkable. but it tells you where we're at yeah, in Texas yeah, politics. Um, to the point about Trump, of those... Uh, statewide Republicans who are running this year, Paxton is the one who continues to attach himself the most to Trump, right? right. Just a couple of weeks ago, he was filing a, you know, filing a brief in a federal court, uh, taking Trump's side about the raid at Mar-a-Lago. He was there at January 6th, right before the, you know, before the riot broke out at the Capitol. Uh, and he was, and I'll tell you this story. Um, so you remember Paxton during the Republican primary was running against George P. Bush, the, the, uh, the land commissioner for attorney. They were running uh, for Paxton's office, attorney general. Um, and the story that I was relayed, uh, I, I was given by some of my sources, was that Bush really, really wanted that Trump endorsement. And I think there's a real problem in the Republican Party where there's no Republicans who step up and say, hey, it's not even that I'm against Trump, but I would like to be an alternative to, what, to the Trump stuff, right? Yeah. Bush didn't do that at all. He just tried to be more Trumpy, even though Trump eventually right. endorsed Paxton. So what? And did you see the koozies that uh, that Bush's people were handing out at his events that had an image of George P. Bush <laughs> with President Trump? And on the bottom of it, it was a quote from Trump that said, 
and this was him, this was Bush throwing his own family under the bus. The quote from Trump was, this is the Bush that got it right. This is the Bush that likes me. Yeah. So yeah, I like right. him. That wasn't an endorsement. It was just something that Trump had said one time. Well, my sources told me that Bush met with Trump twice. And the first time that he was going to meet with Trump, uh, Bush was just there to ask for the endorsement and he didn't get it. Fine. Okay, whatever. And Bush told him, you know, I respect your decision. The second time that he went to meet with Trump, I was told it was at uh, the New Jersey golf course. What is it? Uh, Bedminster yes. where, where Trump, yeah. uh, it was one of his homes. And um, the second meeting was based on the question from Jeb Bush about how much Trump was going to get involved in the campaign. Was he really going to come down to Texas and campaign for Paxton, do videos for him? How much was he really going to put his shoulder into it? Um, and what I was told was that Trump didn't really answer that question. But what he said was this. He said, the, Ken, he's, he, he's like, look, Je, uh, he, look uh, George, I like you, but Ken is the only attorney general in the whole country who would file that lawsuit for me to overturn the election. So I'm with him. Paxton is tied at the hip with Trump. So if anybody goes down over connection to Trump, I would think it would be Paxton. And that's, of course, all of the other baggage uh, that, that, that Paxton has would, would factor into that as well. I mean, when you go around and you talk to people that you and I follow a lot of this stuff for a living. Uh, but when you talk to Texans about, you know, the fact that Paxton has a mistress and that's not really been uh, refuted and that he that he got his uh, mistress uh, hooked up with a job through a shady developer in Austin that, you know, that this shady developer in Austin wanted Paxton to do favors for him, including going after the people who were investigating Paxton, you know, for possible crimes. All of this stuff, most Texans have not even heard about it. They don't even know about any of that. Yeah, that uh, yeah. And so I'm not sure how much of that is is really sticking. Actually, I think there was, if I remember right, the, the UT Tyler poll maybe a month ago uh, had said, but they asked folks about that stuff and, and the numbers showed. People just don't know anything about it. So whether it's really a liability for him, I don't know. That that other personal baggage, I'm not sure. You know, the FBI investigation, he's been under indictment for seven years. Just this week, he's running, he literally ran running away from, from a guy. A subpoena. <laughs> he like ran, running out he the ran back from door. a guy who was trying to serve yeah. a subpoena at his house. All these personal scandals, personal issues. Um, I would think that the thing that, would, that the thing that would overshadow them is his close connection to Trump, which Texas, even a lot of Texas Republicans rejected Trump. And the the way you know that is that in the 2020 election, like I said, Cornyn won his race by 10, Trump won his race by six in Texas, just the Texas numbers. Um, but Republicans did well in all their other races. There are a lot of people who are either Republicans or are open to voting for Republicans who just can't vote for Trump. But this again speaks to the box that it, that you know Republican candidates are in that Trump can only take votes from them, not add any. With Ken Paxton, who is what a personal train wreck. <laughs> I mean, he's the only person I could think of who makes Trump's personal life look look tame and normal. I mean, the two of them together are a Springer show. Mm -hmm. Forget the public for a second. On the Republican side of things, in any, in any moment, forget him running out the back door from somebody giving him a subpoena. You're right. Okay? I'll try to forget that. Have, yeah. yeah. Have Republicans ever said... We, we got to get rid of this guy. That, that, this is enough, man. I mean, come oh, sure. on. I mean, the, forget the mistress, the office being raided multiple times, the felony indictments, mm -hmm. all his staff all quit on him. I mean, I just find it amazing yeah. that somebody on the Republican side doesn't say, this guy's such a train wreck that he's going to lose sooner mm -hmm. or later and we can't afford it. So run the bus over him. Yeah. And look, I, I, I mean, quite candidly, a lot of times that the sort of negative personal problems uh, end up in the news uh, about Paxton, oftentimes it's leaked to the press by Republicans. Uh, now, they, they don't come out. They don't come out publicly and okay. say, hey, we need to be against this guy. And I think there were a lot of Republicans. I, I talked to Republicans all over the place during the primary who were so disappointed at the fact that Bush wasn't running some sort of a campaign that would be effective to take him out, uh, take him out politically. I mean, it, it, he was offering no alternative to the Trump stuff from Paxton. He was just trying to still be the Trump guy, um, you know, during that campaign. So, so yeah, uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of discontent within the Republican ranks among office holders and Republican political professionals. Um, but look, it's Paxton's not about to change because this is what's worked for yeah, him so no, far. It works. It's exactly. in one of the most powerful offices, not just in Texas, but in the country. Didn't George P. Bush, I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Like I said, if you just wrote it down on a big chief tablet and said, here's all of this guy's problems to think that anyone could lose to that is pretty remarkable. Didn't he lose by something like 35 points? That's correct. He had to try real hard.
to lose oh that. <laughs> to, to like lose by is, that. <laughs> like you could put it's almost like they were trying to lose. Like, let's yeah. see how bad it can go. So some folks who used to work for George P. Bush, I mean, would tell me just how frustrated they were with how all that was going. They couldn't believe the, can- the kind of campaign that he was running. Um, and, you know, Bush um, and some of the other uh, Republicans who were running against him, remember, it was a four-way race, uh, and Bush ended up in a, in a runoff with, uh, with Paxton. Um, I think it was Louis Gohmert, the, you know, the, the congressman from East Texas, yeah. who was more aggressive than Bush about bringing up all the personal problems of uh, of Paxton. And when you watch primaries play out, it's one of the things that I've seen over the years, Jeff, is um, when, when two people are running for office and they basically agree on all of the issues, right? They, they agree on, you know, everything, abortion, guns, gay rights, whatever it is, whatever's in front of them at the moment. If there's no daylight between them on issues, that's when it has to be about other things, right? It has to be about whether this guy's a good leader. Yeah. It has to be about whether this person has so many personal problems. That's where you see the nastiest campaigns, ironically. The nastiest campaigns are between people who agree about almost everything. And so during that campaign, you had uh, Louis Gohmert really aggressively saying, look, I agree with Ken about issues, but look at all of the problems. Like you said, he had uh, you know, his top staff walk out of the office and accuse him of federal crimes. You had uh, you know, this accusation of a mistress. You got the accusations of helping this guy out in Austin who's a pretty shady developer. You have the fact that he's been under indictment on securities fraud for something that he admitted to doing yeah. and when he was a member of the Texas House, voted to make it illegal. Right. And then later did and then later did it. And oh by the way, just um, this past week matter- he, just this past week he ran Paxton out of his a, house to get away from a subpoena. And he ran out of his house. Uh, yeah. A friend of mine told me a story about Paxton that I'll tell you. He um, that years ago when Paxton was a Texas House member, as it just gives you an insight to how his brain works. Um, Paxton had a friend from North Texas, from the Plano area, who specialized, his business specialized in fire suppression systems, sprinkler systems. And Paxton had a bill, uh, he had a, a legislative proposal that would have uh, required upgrading of fire suppression systems in state office buildings. And if you, re- if you read the bill, it basically read such that only his friend's company would be able to do, be able to do the work. It's a vendor bill. And my friend of mine goes into the office and he's talking to Paxton, this guy with the, with the fire sprinkler company just happens to be there. And, and they're showing my friend all the, 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 you know, the glossy brochure of the fire suppression system and all this stuff. And, uh, and my friend said, look, the way Paxton thought about it was not necessarily that he was even getting away with anything or doing something corrupt. He just thinks that he's helping. He's like, Oh, uh, they need fire suppression systems. And my, my friend makes fire suppression systems. So why don't we just, you know, make all this work, make it all work together. And I think Paxton probably thinks that he thinks about things that way, across everything. Yeah. So he, you know, President Trump needs some help with winning this election. And so I can help him. I'm in the attorney general's office. So I'll just do it, even though the election results didn't go that way. Yeah. Well, there's this tiny issue of the law, of which he's supposed to be involved in the law and upholding the law. But right. OK, sure. Sure. Scott, great stuff. Uh, let's uh, let's do it again after the debate as we get closer yes, to Election Day. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks, Jeff. Wherever you are on the hot sauce scale, could be hot, mild, somewhere in between, all natural ATX hot sauces has something for you. And I need to add award winning to the ATX hot sauce resume because ATX hot sauce took home two gold medals at the famous Austin Chronicle Hot Sauce Awards. This is a 32 year old event that brings out the biggest and the best in the hot sauce space. And it was the very first time ATX hot sauce had even entered the event. Cool name, cool logo, and very cool slogan. Flavor first, heat second, and instead of saying local all the way, I'll add going national all the way. Order now. Go to atxhotsauce.com. That's atxhotsauce.com. Get the Jeff Ward Show podcast on the Apple or Spotify podcast platform or wherever you're listening right now.